Um, so yeah, my name is James Dibden, and I'm a PhD student from the University of Southampton. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about a quantitative tool that we've developed at Southampton, which we can use to predict the phase composition within the electrolyte of lithium sulfur batteries. Um, and I'd also particularly like to thank a couple of uh, undergraduate students to help me with this, so John Smith and Nan, uh, also my supervisors, Nuri and John, who are in the audience as well. Uh, so just to give a short overview of uh, the polysulfide species, so I'm not going to go into the DSL lithium sulfur batteries, because uh, we've already had some great introduction. However, one thing I just want to reiterate is the fact that during discharge and charge, uh, we get the formation of several soluble polysulfide species. Um, and there have been great efforts, uh, particularly in the literature, to identify these polysulfide species in an attempt to understand the mechanism. However, due to their nature, this has obviously been particularly challenging. So these polysulfide species appear to be only stable in solution, uh, except for maybe LO2S2. They're sensitive to moisture, so we have to analyze them under inert conditions, otherwise we'll get H2S, which is not something that we want. And they're also prone to comproportionation and disproportionation. So even if you were able to either isolate or synthesize just one of these polysulfide species, it would quickly disproportionate into a variety of polysulfide species sort of a thermodynamic equilibrium of the lowest energy. Um, and just a quick mention again to the literature. So there has been, um, there's a lot of work out there on trying to identify the polysulfur species and elucidate the mechanism. Um, lots of really nice work using a variety of different techniques. And as Gregory uh, yesterday mentioned, there's not a, so there's quite a variety of different polysulfur species that have been identified and quite a variety of different mechanisms that have been identified. Um, and I think that the main reason for this is that these polysulfide species and the mechanism is very susceptible, like very susceptible to uh, the conditions of the cell. So depending on which electrolyte you use, the polysulfide species are going to change completely depending on the cell components, depending on the cathode. So depending on your exact cell setup, you're going to see a different mechanism effectively. And whether there's a universal mechanism that covers the whole lithium sulfur battery I'm, I find, I, I find, I'm a bit sceptical. So. Um, but what we thought we'd do is we'd take a different approach uh, and we'd use maybe a ternary phase diagram to explain the system. So there are various, various uh, ternary systems that exist containing one liquid and two <coughs> solids. I've got an example on the board of an example containing uh, water being one liquid and two salts, uh, potassium chloride and sodium chloride. Um, and this is the general sort of... Uh, look of the phase diagram. So at each of the vertices, we have one of the three components. Uh, so at the top, we have 100% water. Uh, on the left side, 100% sodium chloride. On the right, 100% sodium uh, potassium chloride, sorry. Uh, at the top, we have this one phase region where everything dissolves in solution, so both salts. Uh, either side, so we have these like, smaller regions to the left and to the right. These are two phase regions, whereby we have one solid present in each of them and the solution with the dissolved salt in it. And at the bottom, we have the interesting region. So this is the free phase region. This is where we have both solids present, sodium chloride and potassium chloride, and we have the solution. And only at this point is the solution completely saturated with respect to both solids. And we thought, could we not use a similar sort of system to help explain the lithium sulfur battery? So the, we could use our one liquid being our electrolyte and our two solids being solid sulfur and solid lithium sulfide. And this is quite nice because solid sulfur, obviously, we have a lot of at the beginning of, well, fully we have at the beginning of uh, discharge, and at the end of discharge, we should have just lithium sulfide. And we searched, so with this idea, we searched the li uh, literature to see if anyone had already done any work on this. And we were quite surprised in the fact that we'd only found one single publication back in 2014 um, from Claire Gray, among others, that had suggested that maybe a ternary phase diagram uh, could explain. Uh, the inner workings of a lithium sulfur battery. And you can see it has similar sort of features to the one I showed you a moment ago. So you have your electrolyte at the top, <coughs> your sulfur at the bottom, um, and they've chosen to go with lithium on one corner of lithium sulfide sort of in the middle here. But they also have the very similar sort of regions. So they have their one phase region at the top, to, uh, their three phase region at the bottom, and whilst it's quite hard to see, they actually do have two, two phase regions on either side. And we had a similar idea. So we thought the general uh, lithium sulfur phase diagram would look something like this. So we went for electrolyte on the top, uh, we went for our solid sulfur on the bottom, and our solid lithium sulfide on the other uh, vertex. And I just want to explain a little bit about how, so the different phases here. So at the top, uh, in this region, we will have 
a situation where everything dissolves in the electrolyte. So there are no solids present, um, only polysulfides dissolved in the electrolyte. And obviously dissolved sulfur, a little bit of sulfur, dissolved sulfur, and a little bit of dissolved uh, lithium sulfide. Uh, in these two two phase regions, we have, uh, so yeah, two phases. We have either solid sulfur present and dissolved polysulfides in the electrolyte, or we have the dissolved uh, polysulfides in the electrolyte and solid lithium sulfide. And then again, in this interesting region, we have both solids present. So this is our three phase region, and here we have both solids present and the uh, dissolved polysulfides in electrolyte. And the key thing here, which I want to emphasize, is that only here are we truly uh, saturating the electrolyte solution uh, with respect to both sulfur and lithium sulfide. And what this means is that we can add more sulfur or more lithium sulfide or both, and we will not change the concentration of sulfur in terms of polysulfides in the solution or the composition. Um, another few sort of uh, interesting points I just want to make is uh, here we find the sulfur saturation concentration uh, just because we're sort of dissolving more sulfur into our electrolyte. Likewise, here would be lithium sulfide uh, saturation concentration, and here's the interesting congruent solution, which is sort of a minimum concentration uh, you require to uh, get this, reach this ternary phase uh, region. So in order to uh, sort of prove this experimental, uh, prove this phase diagram experimentally, we first of all looked at making uh, polysulfide electrolyte solutions. So we did this in quite a conventional manner, uh, just dissolving sulfur and lithium sulfide in into an electrolyte. And I just wanted to make a point that depending on which precipitate you get will depend on what actually happens to this polysulfide this in the electrolyte solution, right? So for the dilute solutions whereby you dissolve all your sulfur and your lithium sulfide into the solution, then you will know exactly how much sulfur you have in your electrolyte solution and also what the average oxidation state of that sulfur is. Just because you know that all the charges come from the lithium sulfide and none of it's come from the sulfur and everything's dissolved. However, as soon as you get any precipitation, whether that be uh, so just sulfur, lithium sulfide or both, so this would be the two two-phase regions and the ternary phase region, this changes a bit, so you no longer know how much sulfur is present in your electrolyte solutions, and you also no longer know the average oxidation state. And this average oxidation state, I want to like, just clarify now, can be thought of a bit like the um, chain length, the average polysulfide chain length, but a better way to ex just ex simply explain it is that if your average uh, sulfur oxidation state is zero, then it's just sulfur. If it's two minus, then it'd be uh, lithium sulfide, and 0 0.5 minus would be LO2S4, sort of. So we prepared these polysulfide solutions, and what we're particularly interested in is trying to get to this sort of congruent point. So we're trying to get the point where we can dissolve no more sulfur in to our electrolyte, and also we want to determine what the, the average oxidation state was, um, because we thought this would help us really uh, build our phase diagram. So we prepared, some we prepared a variety of solutions, and we also particularly focused on the very, very concentrated solutions. So we're talking here like 10 and 20 molar concentrations, so that we can really saturate the uh, electrolyte with our, with our polysulfides. Um, and then we, so we allowed this also to equilibrate over multiple days, well, even like a week of heating. Uh, and then we also allowed it to equilibrate at room temperature because otherwise it's not consistent. And we filtered it. And then once we filtered it, we're left with our dissolved polysulfides in solution uh, and we went on to analyze them. So there were two unknowns that we needed in order to build our phase diagram. The first one was the total dissolved sulfur concentration. So this is the concentration of sulfur associated with the dissolved sulfur, any polysulfide species, or the lithium sulfide. Um, and secondly, we also, so another way to explain this, sorry, would be in our phase diagram, how far uh, we are in terms of the y-axis, how far up and down it, we are. The second uh, thing we required is the average oxidation state of sulfur. Um, and as I, I've, I've just obviously explained a bit about this already. Uh, but this can be thought of like our x-axis along our phase diagram, so how close to fully charged we are or how close we are to fully discharged. So in order to determine the first, so the total sulfur concentration in our polysulfide electrolyte solutions, uh, we came up with a gravimetric analysis method. Um, and you can, so I'll try to talk it through using the diagrams. So uh, we take a known quantity of our polysulfide electrolyte solution, um, and as you can see, it's like, like typical sort of orange color in this uh, case. Uh, we oxidize it to sulfate, and it goes colorless. And then we precipitate it as barium sulfate. And the nice thing about barium sulfate is it's practically insoluble in water, and it's heavy. 
So then we can collect this using a pre-weighed crucible, and we have a mass. With this mass of sulfur, and knowing our um, volume of polysulfide electrolyte solution we uh, analyzed at the beginning, we can then determine the total sulfur concentration. And we just identified the barium sulfate precipitates as uh, using XRD. And then to determine the average oxidation state, we came up with uh, uv -vis spectroscopic redox titration. Now, for this, we decided to use ferrocinium. So we like ferrocinium because it's got a really high redox potential of about 3.24 volts, so it should quantitatively oxidize all of the polysulfide species present uh, to sulfur. Uh, it's it shows electrochemical reversibility, uh, meaning that it has fast kinetics, and we see this because when we add our polysulfide electrolyte solutions to the ferrocinium, you see the color change uh, instantly. And the other point is the fact that, yeah, there is a color. It is blue. So it has a really nice wavelength uh, absorption peak at 620 nanometers. And this is what we use. We use UVVIS to monitor, effectively, the progression of the reaction. So it's just a simple titration. We add aliquots of polysulfides to our ferrocinium, and we see how much it affects the concentration of the ferrocinium in the solution. And using this uh, value of the slope, which we get, uh, the mole extinction coefficient of ferrocinium, and then using also the total self concentration we determined with the technique before, we can get the total, so the average uh, sulfur oxidation state. And then using these two techniques to analyze these very uh, concentrated solutions, we designed this experimental ternary phase diagram. Um, so here I'm just showing some of the very concentrated solutions that we analyzed. So in order to get to this congruent point, uh, these are prepared as L2S8 or L2S6, 10 molar and 20 molar. Um, and the key thing to take away from this slide, really, is the fact that our electrolyte was one more LRTFSI in dark slain. We use this as a model electrolyte because most people use this with either uh, DME or tag DME. Uh, so we thought it might really be quite applicable to most people. There was a maximum total sulfur concentration of six molar. And the average uh, oxidation state was found to be 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 minus, which is approximately L2S 4 to 5, if you're going to think about it in terms of average chain length. And finally, the, what we wanted to do then is try to use this phase diagram to sort of explain what we're seeing experimentally. Um, so these are discharge profiles, theoretical discharge profiles, but they're equilibrium discharge profiles, which means that they're what you'd expect to see maybe at very, very slow C rates, or even better when you do GRTT and it's the resting potential, because you don't want any effects of the kinetics and all, well, all the R drop and things like that. So what we expect to see is that as we go from A to B, the key points are that the two plateaus, so the upper plateau will decrease in potential, and the lower plateau will increase in potential. And this can be thought of just using basic Nernst equation. Um, and another thing that we expect to see is then as we start to get to this really like congruent point, this really saturated electrolyte solution, uh, the two plateaus actually merge together and we get one plateau. Um, we've not actually managed to obtain this one plateau with the system. I think maybe it's uh, because it absorbs too much, uh, it dissolves too much polysulfides. But if we were to use uh, an electrolyte which has a lower solubility, we'd be able to achieve this. And it's something that has been seen in the literature. So uh, Linda Nazar published a paper in 2014 on non-solvents. They have very low solubility of polysulfides. And she used GITT and observed this one plateau. So it has been um, proven experimentally. Um, so conclusions, just to wrap up. Uh, we've developed two methods to determine the total sulfur concentration of polysulfide electrolyte solutions and the average oxidation state in terms of sulfur. Uh, using these, we were able to uh, determine an experimental ternary phase diagram. Uh, and if further work, we wanted to obtain, obviously, more data points, use other electrolytes. I think that would be really interesting. Um, and also reproduce this one discharge plateau. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Oxys Energy and the EPSRC for funding. Uh, in particular, also Oxys Energy, again, because I've done a few placements with them. They're a really great company. And the, obviously, the University of Stampton and everyone that's uh, helped me there. So thank you for listening. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, just was confused a little bit with the uh, the concept of the uh, three-phase diagram because the, the source of lithium is from the electrolyte, and then you you probe the polysulfides between the two um, sulfur and Li2S. So is it just a co conceptual? Because then I'm concerned with the uh, yeah, degrees of freedom, you know, in, in the yeah. Um, so. Uh, I wouldn't say that our source of lithium comes from, so I know what you mean, obviously, like we do have a source of lithium electrolyte, but what we're really looking at is, in terms of phase time is more of the, 
the, the, the range of oxidation states of sulfur, right? So where we have our two minus and that's completely discharged, our zero and that's completely charged. Um, and then how far across, so where, where this thermodynamic equilibrium lies uh, and how that might change obviously in the future when we analyze different electrolytes, how that may change. Because um, also we think this might affect the discharge plateau even further, so maybe the position of the sort of drop between the two plateau. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, you know, um, you're right in terms of the presentation yesterday where you showed that you could um, get two plateaus with the same energy potentials. So, how, how does that fit together? Um, <laughs> so, what's the question? Sorry, so he. I, I don't really know. What yeah. <laughs> Yes. Well, so when we were doing these Nernst calculations, we were make, using obviously our model uh, phase diagram. So we were saying that we either have these three components. So either you have solid sulfur, solid lithium sulfide, and these dissolved polysulfur solutions. We were kind of lumping them all into one. Um, and it's just simply the fact that as you increase the concentration of the polysulfides, uh, you will naturally start to lower these two, lower the top plateau, increase the, up, uh, the bottom plateau. And eventually, uh, you should be able to converge the two. Uh, but depending on where, so once you've hit that point, uh, it won't be a dead straight plateau. There will be some sort of slopes. And as you go further and further down into that region, uh, probably better sort of solvent and salt electrolytes, which don't uh, dissolve the polysulfides very well, you'd expect to see a dead straight uh, okay, so your theory, so your relaxation theory potential. Yes. I believe so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's all thermodynamic, not kinetic in any way. <laughs> yeah.